Good morning. If you would, open up your Bibles. Oh, and let me see. Uh, Sarah Patty, who's doing slides today? Oh, can I have those notes, please? <laughs> I'm about to preach last week's sermon to you, and uh, since, since you were here last week, you probably don't want that again. We could go off memory, but that usually goes south quickly. <laughs> but if we could go ahead and open your up your, up your Bibles to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Thank you, Kim. John chapter 13 is where we're at today, and we're going to be on verses 1 through 17. And just to kind of review, last week we looked at John chapter 12, verses 44 through 50. We, we ended ended uh, John John chapter 12, and there we see it's the last public uh, public teaching of Jesus. He cries out with much passion and uh, announces again that he has been sent from the Father, that there is going to be final judgment, there is a last day as well, and he, he goes into these various themes that he is the light of the world, and it's kind of a, if you've been following along in the book of John, it is a repeat, but it's a concentrated repeat, a concentrated summary of the teaching of Jesus so far. And then in chapter 13, like we get to today, there's going to be a change where he goes to mainly emphasizing and teaching the disciples themselves. So if you would, look with me at uh, verse 1, John chapter 13. We'll go through verse 17. We'll read this section. And again, kind of like a couple of weeks ago, we're not ending cleanly on a paragraph today, but that's okay. Uh, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put out, put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, you are right, so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray as we study your word today, as we glean on the truths that are there, that uh, again, your, your Holy Spirit would move upon us, Lord, to, to see these things rightly, to see these things correctly, and to see the lessons that are there, Lord, not only theologically, but practically for our life. God, uh, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear clearly your word today. And thank you, Lord, for giving us this teaching on humility that we have before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if we look back at verse 1, uh, again, we're, going, we're shifting over chapter 12 to chapter 13. Uh, public, public teaching is now done. He's going to the disciples. And, uh, and Jesus, or John opens up to kind of a time stamp and a purpose as we go forward from here. It is the Passover week. It is the, during the Passover feast, a seven-day feast. You guys know this by now, but this is one of the required feasts, right? One of the three required feasts by the law of God that um, the male family representative had to go back to around the temple to Jerusalem every single year. It was the law. Uh, Passover time was here. Jesus had entered into Jerusalem on the day that people were picking their lambs. It was called Lamb Selection Day. The lamb had to be picked on that particular day. Uh, so while people were out picking their lambs, 
to, to replay as they were supposed to the Passover and bring their sacrifice to the temple, Jesus comes in riding on a small donkey, presenting himself as the lamb that's going to take away the sins of the world. Uh, during this week, we, this week, we also had the voice of God uh, said, yeah, I will glorify your name. People heard that as well. And now the disciples are going to be taking of this Passover feast, and they are together. Uh, also in this, verse 1, look with me. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world uh, to the Father. Uh, and as we look at this, we, we stuck on this quite a while uh, back just to kind of review. The hour is really important in the book of John, in his gospel. It plays prominently in there. Uh, before chapter 12, Jesus talks about the hour that is to come. The hour that is to come. The hour that get, is to come. And then we get to chapter 12, and there's a big transition that the hour is now here. Uh, look with me over there at John chapter 12, and we'll also look at this, how it is in verse 1 of 13 as well, this transition of the hour. This hour has to do with his climactical purpose for being here. It, it, is, it is the point of him being here. But there in John chapter 12, 27 through 32, we begin to see what he's talking about by this last hour. Uh, it says in verse 27, now is my soul troubled, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. And again, this is not a literal time of one hour. It is the last epoch, the last time period seen here of Jesus' life on earth. He continues, Before this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of the world be cast out. And when I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So here he begins to announce in chapter 12, the hour is right now. This is my purpose. This is why I have come. And from that chapter 12 passage, 27 through 32, uh, we, we can pick out several things. Now, what he means by the hour, it is going to include several things that, that go beyond a literal hour. But it includes, number one, uh, Jesus being lifted up or dying on the cross, according to those passages. My hour has now come. It is time for me to be lifted up. Uh, it includes his death. Uh, number two, we also see this hour is including Satan being cast out. Now is the time he must be lifted up and Satan will be cast out. We spent a quite a time looking on that and what it means that it, Satan has been cast out. We looked in the book of Revelation as well uh, and, and tying these things in together that he is now limited in his reach. Uh, and the Gentiles are now the, uh, open to be evangelized, open to the gospel. And we see that set up there in John chapter 12 because the Greeks came, Gentiles came to talk to Jesus. And they're talking to Jesus and he say, hey, this is time. It is my hour. I'm going to be lifted up and I'm going to cast out Satan and I'm going to draw all people to myself. So look at the third one there um, from John 12, 27 through 32 is that Jesus will draw all people, Jews and Gentiles, to himself for salvation. So all this is included in that last hour. And that's, that's where we're at as we're going into the book of John. If the hour was coming, now the hour is here, and we're on the last hour. And now from today's passage, 13 verse 1, we see that this hour also includes, and you can see it back there in chapter 12 as well, but very clearly it includes his departure and his ascension back to the Father. So it includes his departure and ascension back to the Father. We see that in verse 1. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. So all this is the closing chapter, the closing hour, the final breaths of Jesus' life as he only has hours to before he is betrayed and crucified. Uh, let's continue on there. Uh, in verse 1, he continues on saying, Having loved, uh, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And that's, that's kind of an interesting way of putting it. He said the, the wording here John uses, he loved them to the end. There's two ways it can be looked at. He loved them to the end of his life or his end of his time. But, and and that, that can be a translation to that. But, but most likely it is to the end, meaning 
fully, absolute, complete. There is no more he could have loved them. So instead of just time, like I will love you for this amount of time till the end and then I'm gone, it's he loved them absolutely, completely, in totality. There's no more love that he could give to them. All right? Now, what kind of love is that? It's kind it's kind Today, people, it's been Valentine's Day, right? And and whatever you think of that, you know, you get all the you get a lot of uh, things said, you know, like hey, the card might say I love you to the moon and back or something like that, right? Or I love you to infinity or uh, Buzz Lightly year I love you to infinity and beyond or something. All right, uh, all those are ways, and you, you're you're looking at cards or thinking on these things, and all these are ways that we try to express. I love you to the max. I love you to, I can't love you any more than this, right? Well, this is, this is what is being said here by John. When he says, I love you to the end, to the, the telos there, there is no more that Jesus can give. He is giving his all. He is loving them completely. Now, who does Jesus love to the end? Uh, you look back at verse 1 toward the end there. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved his own. All right, so look at this again. Who does he love to the max, to the end, uh, beyond to the moon and back? All right, who does he love to the max here? Uh, his own, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So this is, this is a... This is, of course, uh, if you're uh, more Arminian leaning or Calvinistic leaning in your soteriology and your view of salvation, of course, this verse will be a, be a complicated thing for the more Arminian believer. The Reformed person will see this and have no problem with this. And it's, it's not saying that Jesus loves the entire world with this maximum level totality of love. Who does he love? He actually loves his own. And actually, you see the delineation there. He loves his own who were in the world. So John could have easily put there, having loved the world to the end, but he said he delineates, and there is a difference there. He's loving his own to the end. And we see this commonly in the book of John. John is, is setting aside and, and letting us see who he is truly loving to the end and whose sin he is going to truly pay for. A couple of cross-references. Look over at John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verses 14 through 16. That entire section is, is really great. We're just going to read a couple of verses out of it. John 14, verse 14 through 16. So who are Jesus' own that he loves to the end? Here in John chapter 10, he says, I am the good shepherd, I know my own. We see the same wording again. And my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. So here he lets us know who his own are, and he lets us know what he's going to do for his own. What is he going to do? He is going to die for his sheep. He had already announced to the Pharisees that they do not listen because they do not hear because they are not his sheep. Uh, but he is going to die for his sheep. And this is just a, a note here. This is sometimes what we call. If you follow the acronym TULIP closely, that L there is for limited atonement. Some, uh, even R.C. Sproul uh, renamed it, I believe, particular redemption. Some others will say specific atonement or, or specific redemption. The point of it is, is that Jesus is dying for his sheep, his own. That is the same group of people. He is loving his own to the end, to the max. All the way, there's no more love that he can give them. We are saved by grace. He is poured he is on the cross. He is dying for our sin. Uh, chapter 10, who is he going to die for? Not every person who has ever been born into the world or will be born, but he's going to die for his sheep. It's not, it, it is absolute and certain that this is who he is going to die for. And you take this, today's passage, John chapter 10, uh, John chapter 6. Look over there, John chapter 6. Uh, multiple places you can look at, but we're just going to look at 37 and 40 of John chapter 6. But here you see the same thing again. Uh, Jesus does, does, does Jesus die for everyone in the world? No, he dies for his sheep. And uh, 
Does Jesus love everyone to the end? No, he loves his own to the end. And this is clearly taught in John chapter 6, 37 through 40. Look at this. All, the fa- all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So in this passage, we clearly see that God the Father is giving this, this particular unit of people, you might say. The most common term uh, in the New Testament that we see is the elect. Uh, here Jesus referred to his sheep. Uh, today's passage, his own. But it's all speaking about the same body of believers here. So in verse 37, the Father gives this body, body to the Son. They will come to the Son. This is unconditional election. It's an irresistible calling. God the Father gives them to the Son. They will come to the Son. And then will some of them be saved and some of them not be saved? No. All of them will be saved. All of them will be raised up. Why? Because that is who Jesus died for. Their sins have been forgiven. They are saved. That God the Father gives them to the Son. They come to the Son. The Son raises them up. It is a complete, absolute God process. If we had to do anything with our salvation or keeping our salvation, number one, we would never be saved. And number two, we would lose our salvation as soon as we got it, right? But fortunately, not fortunately, that's a bad word, providentially, <laughs> uh, sovereignly, God is, for, is, is, is orchestrating that salvation from beginning to the end. And Jesus loves us to the end, to the max by coming to die on the cross for us. So we see that there laid out. He loves his own to the end who are in the world. All right? And there is a difference there. Uh, Let's go on down to verse 2 of John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 2. He continues on. says, During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him. We'll we'll pause there for a moment, okay? Uh, Did Judas do what he wanted to do, or was he forced to do it by Satan? So that's something interesting to think on. Uh, Was Judas forced to betray Jesus, or did he do this on his own? And what we find is that Judas was a willing participant in all of this. His heart was revealed to be not a child of God. And uh, and we'll get into this in the coming weeks, but there was quite a bit of camouflage there that the disciples did not realize it. They, they assumed he was just like them, but he was clearly not. So we have Judas, who is not a follower of Christ truly, even though physically he is. And that's, that's pretty wild to imagine. You spend all this time with Jesus, see all the miracles, see everything he's doing, hear the teaching, but yet you are not a true follower of Christ. Jesus Christ. In fact, he's the opposite of that and is following Satan. We see the same type of thing uh, with the Pharisees where they claim to be children of Abraham, right? And they use that as their boast. And they sit in the seat of Moses and they drop these big patriarchal names with Moses and Abraham. And Jesus says, no, your father is actually Satan. That's who your father is. And uh, so it is truly with everyone. If Christ is not uh, your father, then Satan is your father and you're doing what he wants you to do. So you see this working together with Judas. And, and look over at Judas. I think this is a good cross reference. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. And hold your, hold your place there in John. Look over at Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Uh, Again, I think Ephesians 2 is probably one of our most cross-referenced chapters in all of our time here in Pecan Creek. If you don't have it memorized, maybe you should, then you just quit flipping over there. But uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, you see how this works together, I think. And and even there with with, uh, Judas and and, and with Satan and the the plot to kill Jesus. So just look at this. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So in this passage, obviously, we have children of wrath 
are also following the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan himself. And how do they do that? They do it by living according to their flesh, according to their passions, according to their desires. So we see these things one and the same, that following Satan and following what you want and your passions, your desires are one in the same. So even with Judas, if you think on him, it's not that it's not a lot of times people think of this as like, oh, Satan like possessed him at that time. We don't see that kind of wording there. Uh, it is one and the same. He is a child of Satan. He is following the, the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan himself. And he is a son of disobedience. And yet he is doing exactly what he wants to do. He is following his flesh, his own selfish desires. And we see that from just earlier in John chapter 12, verses 4 through 5, where he is so mad because Mary is anointing Jesus' feet with this, this, this perfume that's uh, worth a year's wages. And he, he takes the high road, supposedly. We could have sold this and given it to the poor, but, uh, but instead he was actually going to keep it for himself because he had been stealing the entire time. So we see that his heart was already wicked, and uh, we see that he and Satan are working together during this betrayal. All right, let's move on to chapter, or verse 3 there in chapter 13. And Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. Now, this is interesting. And John does this several different places in the book of John, but it seems like John is painting the picture for a very chaotic scene that is about to take place and is kind of taking place at this time, and yet he throws in the sovereignty of God right after that. So he mentions Judas, that Satan and, Satan, and the betrayal that is coming, and all that is seemingly, from our point of view, and especially from the disciples' point of view, absolute chaos that is about to come. That Judas, one of their own, is going to betray him. He's going to get arrested. He's going to get beaten. He's going to get crucified on the cross. He is going to die. And all this is just horrific and, and, and so troubling. Even the disciples, after Jesus dies, can't picture why, how, what, what has happened, how can this be? And yet, John writes, he introduces Satan here and Judas working together to betray Jesus. And yet, you have this sovereignty statement. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. What is, it? What is John's purpose? He, he's saying, hey, all this is happening exactly as planned according to God. All things were happening exactly as they were supposed to happen. Uh, as we'll get to later, this is a fulfillment of prophecy that one of Jesus' own would, would betray him, right? Uh, everything is lined out perfectly. In Peter's Pentecost sermon, he stands up and announces that as well, that God worked through these wicked men to bring about what was prophesied. It was all part of his sovereign plan. So the point of this seems to be, John is saying, hey, Jesus did not lose control. He did not lose control of the, the situation. It wasn't that he was not powerful enough to stop this from happening. He was absolutely powerful enough. But he was doing exactly what was supposed to happen. Look at verse 4. Um, was going, oh, well, before you get there, going back to God. Uh, again, we, we mentioned this earlier there in verse 3. It's mentioned again in uh, verse 1. It's mentioned as well. But that you see also the transition in the book of John that he has been sent from God, he's been sent from God, he's been sent from God. I think it's over 12 times as mentioned so far. And then again, here in this last hour, it shifts over to that he is going back to God. So it's just the last hour. Everything is changing here. He's going to go back to God. Uh, verse 4, he rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So here's the scene. Uh, you, you have the disciples who have showed up for the feast of the Passover. It is a great feast. All, everything is in place and uh, the food is all in place. The table is in place. And you would picture this kind of a low table with people leaning into that table. Everything is there. They begin to eat. Uh, but one thing was missing. There was no one there to wash their feet. 
And now this would have been absolutely customary. The only thing we could kind of relate it to culturally, kind of, but you really can't get there, would be washing your hands before you eat. Uh, it, but that's, that's still nothing compared to this. They wore sandals. The environment was very dry. The environment was very dusty. They had just come from Bethany, two miles away. They had walked through dirt and sand and grit all the way there. And they were, their feet would be very dirty. And it was absolutely customary, essential, that someone be there to wash the feet. This was, this was hospitality. They had everything there for it. They had all the items there ready for someone to wash the feet but there was no one there to wash them. And as we, we covered last time, as we looked at Mary, Mary washed the feet of Jesus when his disciples did not, apparently, anointed them with this precious oil. And it was like, and even then, the disciples didn't get it. Not only Judas complained, but the other disciples complained as well. But she was understanding uh, what needed to be done and seeing Jesus for who he truly was. Here, there is no one to do it. Usually it would go to, you might say, the lowest person in the home, so it could be a slave, it could be a servant, uh, it could be the, the, the mother of the house or the woman of the house, it could be a widow in the house, it could even be an older child, etc. There's no one there. So instead of the disciples uh, doing this themselves, they just ignore it. And as we see, they began to eat. All right? So at, they had already begun and getting up from supper. So there would be no excuse. No disciple could say, oh, I was... Just about to do that, Jesus. You beat me to the punch, right? He lets them come in. Everyone gets comfortable. Time is going by. They begin to eat. And still no one takes the lowly position of washing any feet. So with no servant present to wash their feet, it meant that one of them would have to do it. Which one of the disciples is going to do it? And the whole point is none of them is going to do it. Not one of them is going to wash Jesus' feet or each other's feet. And we see this, this cyclical pride coming up in the disciples. And you see it in all of the Gospels. And you look at different places. But they're, they're still very prideful in their following of Jesus. And multiple places we can go. But I want you to look at a couple. Look at Mark 9, uh, verse 33 through 35. And again, hold your place there in John 13. But look at Mark chapter 9. Look at verse 33 through 35. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If any one of you would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And Jesus had just taught on this in Mark chapter 8 as well. Uh, and and st instead of them getting the point and going, aha, pride is bad, humility good. Uh, no, they, they take off walking and again they start fighting over which one of them is the greatest. And Jesus knew what they were fighting about the entire time. He asked them, and once again he teaches them, verse 35, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. So this is a lesson that they should have known when they sit down to have the Passover, and they have Jesus Christ himself there, God in the flesh, that would seen all these miraculous signs and wonders, that would seen even Mary just treat him with such dignity and such royalty, washing his feet with precious oil, and yet they sit down and they just start eating food and ignore this altogether. They do not want to be a servant. They are still troubled by pride and, uh, and wanting to be great in each other's eyes. Look at Mark chapter 10. So this lesson is, is in Mark chapter 8, it's in Mark chapter 9. Look at 10, 35 through 45. Mark chapter 10, 35 through 45. Same thing basically is repeated, just a little different flavor here. And James and John, the son of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Uh, and he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left hand in your glory. She has said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup with which I drink or to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. 
And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared. And when they, the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to him, them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So here again, you see this rep repetition, repetition, repetition here. And supposedly we learn by repetition. The disciples did not. Uh, they were not learning by repetition. Here again, he said, you must be servant of all. And now they have, and it's one thing to say, aha, okay, I got it, yep. Pride bad, humility good, I'm a servant of all, absolutely. But then you fast forward, now they're in a time where they have to show this, it has to be revealed, and they have every opportunity to practice this humility, and they all get an F. They all fail, absolutely. And, and so it is, it is easy to say that you're a humble person uh, verbally, or even right now. You could put yourself in their shoes or sandals and be like, hey, I would have definitely washed Jesus' feet, you know. And, uh, and then later on today, you're in an opportunity to, be, to show humility and not pride. And, and it's, it's much different to walk it out. So here we see this lesson that is repeated, repeated, repeated. They get the ultimate opportunity here. It is time. No servant has showed up. And what does Jesus do? He takes off his garment and dresses himself just like a slave, a servant would and he takes on the role of the slave of the servant and begins to wash their feet. And this had to be. You can imagine the awkward silence that was there. It's like, oh, yeah, that humility thing, right? And it, 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 oh, it's just, it has to be just eating at them that their teacher, their rabbi, the Christ, the Messiah, the Lord, the Savior of the world, the light of the world, the great I Am, had to stoop to wash my feet because I was too prideful to do so. Because I didn't want the disciple, other disciples to think that I think that I'm lower than them. So this is what's going on. And we get to verse 6. And we see the awkward silence is broken here as John records that Peter opened his mouth. Which is quite common for Peter. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And here we have this, the awkward silence is broken. We don't know what, what number of disciples he was during this foot washing process, but he is shocked by it. and says, Lord, do you wash my feet? Almost as in, like, this, you can't do such a thing. Uh, and Jesus says, you're... I am going to do this, and you're not understanding why I'm doing this at the time, but you are going to understand. Um, uh, and, G and Peter was notorious, again, for opening his mouth too quickly. You know, you think of like the transfiguration of Christ, where, where they're up on the mountain, uh, the mountain of transfiguration, we often call it. And there you have Moses, you have Elijah, you have the voice of God. And, uh, and the Shekinah glory of Jesus shining forth. And you have James, John, and Peter there, and they're watching. And, and the other two just are like, whoa, it's amazing. And Peter's like, hey, you want me to build you two sh shacks, two shelters? It makes no sense. And when you read it in the text, you're like, what's he even talking about? And then the, David, it, it, the gospel writer even records he said this because he did not know what he was talking about. It's like... <laughs> It's like, it just, he just talks. So you think of Peter, you kind of think, uh, you know, you, it's hard time sometimes to get the, the personalities of people. And sometimes we read the Bible very cold, cold and monotone. But the more you, Peter speaks up, you realize he didn't have much filter. All right. And he would just speak and uh, be very quick. And, and here again, it's just he's everyone else is quiet. Everyone else is quiet. And I got to say something. Oh, Lord, will you wash my feet? Yes. That's why I wash the other six. And I'm progressing around the room. Right. But he he has to he has to say something. He's a, not a lot of filter there. So this happened. That happens multiple times in the in, in Peter's life, it seems. Uh, he also says there in this verse seven, uh, what I'm doing now 
you do not understand, but afterward you will understand. And this is not, it, it's, uh, you see the disciples growing and learning, and they have come somewhat further than they were originally. They're at least acknowledging who he is, but yet you see this, this test of humility and pride. They've absolutely failed, uh, but they don't understand everything that is happening, and, and it takes a while for them to do so. Uh, it is not until the death of Jesus, his resurrection, his ascension, and giving of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost that they have a much fuller understanding of Christ's servitude. It's, it takes a while for all this to develop, and there's, there's finally this, now we see, right? And even before this, they're fighting about who's going to be at your right hand, who's going to be at your left hand when you come into your kingdom. That what kingdom they're talking about, they're still thinking like others. That he's going to rule and reign right here, and I want to be in the place of promise and prestige, and I want to be in the place of power. And they're still thinking earthly back here in, in Mark. And Jesus is teaching, no, you must be last in order to be first. And, and they're still not processing all of this. It's not until Jesus gives himself up fully to die. He rises from the dead, ascends into heaven, Holy Spirit comes, that they're fully putting all of this together. And you see that in Peter's sermon, and that Pentecost sermon in Acts chapter 2. Uh, we also see when, when Jesus comes back from the dead, right? He's walking on the road to Emmaus. The disciples are distraught. Why? Because they don't understand. And Jesus calls them foolish. He's like, you don't understand? And then he takes them back through the Old Testament and shows that all these things had to take place exactly as had been recorded by God in the Revelation ahead of time. And then they realize, wow, all right? Same thing happens to the disciples in the closed room. When Jesus comes in, he take, takes them all the way back, shows them how all these things had to happen, and their, their understanding increases at that time. Also, we don't want to negate the role of the Holy Spirit. John 16, we'll get to that uh, in a few weeks, months, or years. John 16, uh, chapter 12, uh, chapter 16, verse 12 through 13, uh, says this, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. So here we see that there's, in John chapter 16, Jesus is getting closer to death, teaching the disciples. He's, he's, implore, he's letting them know that the Spirit is going to be involved in your teaching, in your understanding, and that is yet to come. On the day of Pentecost, we have the, uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the believers there. This incre the Spirit of truth has come and guides them. So that's why we have... Uh, we trust in the, the New Testament writers because they, it is, we have the words of Christ, we have the words of the apostles who have been taught by Jesus, who have been taught by the Spirit as well. And these truths, what Jesus is teaching, become so much clearer now as we get into the writings of the apostles. There you see their understanding has greatly increased, and uh, you see their, their servitude has greatly increased as well. All right, let's move on to John 13, verse 8. Look there with me. Uh, we'll read through 11. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but it is, is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him, that was why he said, not all of you are clean. So Simon Peter, again, using his own uh, rationale, takes this a little bit too literally here. Uh, well, if, if you, I need my feet washed uh, to be, if I need to be wa wash my feet, wash all of me. And it's, it's just, it's, it's, if you're looking at that going, That's, that doesn't make much sense, you're right. It's kind of like he says, like, hey, Elijah and Moses, let me build them two tents back here. And like, no, they just came from heaven, all right? They don't need your tent to live in. And here again, it's kind of like, it's, he's trying, he, it's, he's exuberant and excitable. And he's like, I had not only my feet, but everything, because I want to, to belong to all, to you fully, for my whole entire body. And uh, he says, no, 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 you, you are clean. But then he makes a distinction, but not all of you are clean in this room. There is one who is not clean. Judas is there. So what does he mean by clean? Uh, this is that spiritual cleansing 
that is often symbolically represented by cleansing with water that Jesus is talking about. So he is, he is saying you, you don't need a bath, you have been cleansed already. Even the song we sang before I got up to preach was, was about that cleansing, the grace that has cleansed us, that God has done such a thing. Uh, lots of cross-references we could go to look at this, but I just want you to look at this one. I believe it will be up here, First John 1, 7. John, the author of the Gospel of John we're looking at, says this, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So you have this cleansing that is there. The, 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 the figure of speech, the metaphor would have to be would do with something being dirty and has been cleansed by water. But, but we don't need to be cleansed from our dirt. We need to be cleansed from our sin, right? So how can sin filthiness, how can a sin dirty person be cleansed? What do we put on that to get rid of that, to wash it clean? No amount of water can wash away your sin. We need the work, the, the blood of Jesus Christ, the cross work of Christ. That's how we are free from our sin. He dies. His blood and body is sacrificed for our sin. We are cleansed from our sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. So G, uh, Peter is, is finding out here, Jesus says, hey, all of you are cleansed. This had not happened yet, but they are still of his own. They are still his sheep. They are still listening, obeying him. They are going to be cleansed fully, ultimately, by the blood of Jesus Christ. But he knows his own, and these are his own. One of them is not. And, of course, we know from what John says, it is Judas. Uh, look at verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put, out, put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now, this, this is a, a poignant teaching, all right, strong point here. They have, he has just taken on the, the dress, the outfit, the garb of a slave, and has taken on the role of a slave, lowered himself to washing the dirt out from between their toes. I mean, this is extreme humility here. And now he begins to put some, some words to this teaching here. They call him teacher and they call him Lord. But yet, and these are both high titles. I mean, you are the, they, they call him rabbi, teacher. They called him Lord. Yet, due to their pride, none of them had volunteered to wash his feet. So what were they to do with Jesus' lesson in humility? They were to love one another as Christ did by serving one another. And so this is the point of this text. Uh, what are we supposed to do with the story of Jesus washing feet? Uh, some Christians in the past, it has not been popular or common at all, take this literally to mean that now we are supposed to wash each other's feet, and they put it up there with, with, with uh, Lord's Supper uh, in baptism, and that we are supposed to wash each other's feet as well. We don't see that in the rest of the New Testament. We don't really see that laid out anywhere. We don't see that being the main point of this. And we don't see it repeated except, uh, if you want to look at with me, 1 Timothy 5, 9 through 10. Uh, foot washing is not mentioned uh, after this, except in 1 Timothy 5, 9 through 10. So Jesus says that they, they are supposed to do, well, we'll get to that in a minute. They are supposed to do this, but it is not, it is not a, what you might call an ordinance, or might, some people might call a sacrament, something that must be repeated uh, uh, within the church, etc. But look at 1 Timothy 5, 9 through 10. We'll see how it is looked at. Uh, here Paul is telling Timothy that, to create this role of widows that need to be helped by the church. And not all widows need to be helped by the church or are, are qualified to be helped by the church. He says, create this role. These women should be helped. Uh, Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age. 
having been the wife of one husband, and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. So here we see foot washing for what has always been, it is mentioned in the Old Testament multiple times, as a show of hospitality, as a sign of hospitality, and as a sign of humility. Uh, so the widow that should be added to this list should be known as a person who washes the feet of saints. And that's the only other time that we see this here uh, mentioned in the passage. Now, that, be, that was a low position, and some of the, if, if, if she was known for not doing such a thing, it would be a symbol of pride. So that, that this, all this goes right in together. She shows hospitality. She's washed the feet of the saints. All right. So the point of this is, Jesus is not saying, do this exactly, although that could be a great show of humility. The main point of Jesus teaching this is humility. Don't be afraid to take on the lowest role in the room. In fact, as God sees it, that position is number one, not the end. And it's a total opposite way that our world looks at power and prestige and who's important, right? Uh, who's important is the one who always is number one, gets the most attention, the most popular, the most money, the most stuff, the biggest houses, the biggest cars, etc. The one who is always sitting at the head of the table. And then you have God. Think about it. God in the flesh, washing the dirt, nasty dirt, miles of walking, uh, washing the dirt out from under the disciples' feet and toes. That is true humility. If you consider this at all, like how far did he have to stoop as far as humility goes versus them? Like he created them. He is God, all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, spoke and created the universe, created humanity. They're worried about lowering themselves a little bit to wash one another's feet. I mean, just a little bit. If you really think about it, compared to God, lowering himself to wash his creation's feet. But yet they were unwilling to even go that far. All right. Now, uh, last verse here, verse 17. He says, If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And, and this seems to be a, a case also that he is saying that these things, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. It doesn't say if you do just this, wash feet, you are blessed. But blessed are you if you do them. So it is acts of humility. It is taking on the role of a servant, not just here at this in this one way, but in all of life. Blessed. This is like this is one of the beatitudes of the book of John, where it's blessed are you, uh, like like uh, the, the beatitudes. Blessed are you. Blessed are those who are in the house of mourning, or blessed. Are, and and it's it's a a position. If you do these things. You are blessed by God. So he says, I know, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And the last verse is a great reminder that it's not enough to have the head knowledge of serving others. Like the disciples had, they've been taught over and over and over and over. But blessed are you if you not just know them, but if you do them. And that's, that's, that's the big test. It is easy to claim that you are not a selfish person. It is far more difficult to live it out. And that is a daily challenge for all of us. Uh, in summary, if the one who created the universe can humble himself to wash feet, then surely we can humble ourselves to serve one another. And I would encourage you, uh, even now and in discipleship, to think on this today. How do I apply this to my life? How can I serve my brothers and sisters in Christ even better than I am? If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great example we have in Jesus Christ, who being God in the flesh was willing to lower himself to wash disciples' dirty, filthy feet and help us to take this, to see this, and understand that if he could do this, then surely we can humble ourselves and live as we're supposed to as a servant to others. God, I pray that 
We would not fail the test when we're given the opportunities to serve others. Help us not look to be first or most important uh, in the room or to be glorified by the world and consider how they think of us and want to be high, highly high exalted by them. But help us to see how you see things. Uh, help us to be a servant to all. Help us to look at the needs of others and strive to meet those needs and to help them in, in all that we can do to do such a thing. God, help us not to be prideful. Help us not to be arrogant. Help us not to look to be number one, but help us to look at others, consider them more important than ourselves, and help us to do everything that we can to love, to encourage, and to serve each other. In Jesus' name we pray.